good morning. It's nice to have all of you here today, and I want to take a moment to share a few announcements with you. Uh, normally, aren't many at this particular point in the service, but there are more today, and we'd like to welcome those who are watching us online as well. First of which is, uh, moms, do you have a flower? You should have gotten one on the way in. If not, uh, please get one on the way out. Uh, our way of recognizing today is Mother's Day. Also, we'd like to encourage you after the service, uh, if you would look over to the office area in the gathering space, you're going to see this fairly large apple tree, and on it, apples, and on the apples, a variety of descriptive things that uh, we've dreamt up that might be uh, incredible welcome gifts for the new pastor and his wife, Molly, as they plan and prepare to join us. Uh, Sean's installation ordination will be on the 11th of July, and we're in the process of collecting all those gifts. So please take a look at that tree, and if it's something, one of those apples that you say, you know, I could do that, just pull the apple off and take it with you, and then when you have that thing, just bring it into the office. And as you're looking over there at that tree, you're going to see in the office a big wicker basket. And that's where we're putting everything that comes back in. So uh, when you get that thing you've pulled off in the apple, just put it in the wicker basket, and we'll have them all collected and ready to go hopefully by the end of the month. So take a look at that. There are also two homeless bags left, and that's not many, but we would like them all to disappear. So uh, the uh, youth in our congregation, Confirmation Youth, put together some baskets, and we have all have had the experience of people on the roadside with signs and wondering what we should do with that. Well, the youth came up with a grand idea and would invite you to take a, a bag with you, put it in the car, and when you find yourself at that intersection, please hand that bag to that person, if you would. So let's get all those bags out there so they can make the impact that the youth would intend us to make with them. So look at that. So a couple of reasons for you to kind of wander around the gathering space after the service today. The third I'm going to invite you, because this is my second experience with this in the time I've been here as pastor. Uh, yesterday afternoon, uh, sometime during the day, someone broke into my car and stole, of all things, my gym bag. I hadn't washed that stuff for over a week. <laughs> so they got some crusty socks and a crusty shirt, and I'm not sure what else. But, but the point being, if you're leaving things in your car, that's probably not a good idea. And even if you have your doors locked, but they can see what's inside, probably not a good idea. So to discourage the opportunists that are wandering around our parking lot while we're in here, please lock your door and put the things in out of sight, if you would. Uh, particularly crusty gym clothes put those away. Literally the second time they stole a gym bag from me, and I, there's never been anything in there that I thought they'd want. And, and so I drove around the neighborhood thinking, surely they found a corner, and they've opened it up and went, oh, bummer, and then just threw it out so that I could retrieve my gym bag, but I haven't found it yet. So uh, also um, want to encourage you to grab a communication and prayer card. You're going to see those in the pew. We've only been doing this for two weeks, and I know those of us who have been here for years know we have done them, but we pulled all the paper and all the touch stuff away for a very long time, and now we're reintroducing some of that. So there's a card in front of you. On one side, it records your attendance. The other side, any prayer requests that you have. You have a reason to fill it out either way. So if you would please do that, fill it out, and then put it in the collection plate at the end of the service out in the gathering space, either directly behind you or over here under the west side, and we'll attend to what's on those cards first thing on Monday. A lot of announcements, and I apologize for that, but I have just one more thing to do. Moms, would you stand up for me for a moment? We're going to invite you as you stand to sing for the rest of us a solo. <laughs> Actually, we're going to pray for you. Let's pray. Merciful and gracious Father, we pray for these ladies. We thank you for the gift that they are to us. We thank you for their love and their ability to express your love to those around them. And we ask that you bless them on this day. Strengthen them in their one true faith. 
and keep their eyes always fixed on Jesus. Lord, we thank you for them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please rise. Let's continue with our next verse. to the Lord a new song, for he has done marvelous things. His right hand and his holy arm have worked salvation for him. Shout joy to the Lord, all the earth. Burst into jubilant song with music. Make music to the Lord with harp, with the sound of singing, with trumpets, and with the blast of the ram's horn. Shout for joy before the Lord, the King. Let the sea resound in everything in it. Let the rivers clap their hands. Let the mountains sing together for joy. Let them sing before the Lord, for he comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world in righteousness and the peoples with equity. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Ghost. Amen. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father together. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you, God, word and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways. To the glory of your holy name, amen. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ, was given to die for us and for his sake. He forgives us all of our sins. And to those who believe on his name, he gives the power to become the children of God and promises them, bestowing upon them his Holy Spirit. May the Lord who has begun this good work in us bring it to completion in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. 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 We sing.
Thank you. Let us pray. O oh God, the giver of all that is good, by your holy inspiration grant that we may think those things that are right and by your merciful guiding accomplish each and every one of them. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Please be seated. The first reading is from Acts chapter 11, verses 19 to 30. Now, those who had been scattered by the persecution in connection with Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, telling the message only to Jews. Some of them, however, men from Cyprus and Cyrene, went to Antioch and began to speak to Greeks also, telling them the good news about the Lord Jesus. The Lord's hand was with them, and a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. News of this reached the ears of the church at Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas to Antioch. When he arrived and saw the evidence of the grace of God, he was glad and encouraged them all to remain true to the Lord with all their hearts. He was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and faith, and a great number of people were brought to the Lord. Then Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul, and when he found him, he brought him to Antioch. So for a whole year, Barnabas and Saul met with the church and taught great numbers of people. The disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. During this time, some prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch. One of them, named Agabus, stood up and through the Spirit predicted that a severe famine would spread over the entire Roman world. This happened during the reign of Claudius. The disciples, each according to his ability, decided to provide help for the brothers living in Judea. This they did, sending their gifts to the elders by Barnabas and Saul. This is the word of the Lord.
The second lesson is from 1 John chapter 5, verses 1 to 8. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and everyone who loves the Father loves his child as well. This is how we know that we love the children of God, by loving God and carrying out his commands. This is love for God, to obey his commands. And his commands are not burdensome, for everyone born of God overcomes the world. This is the victory that has overcome the world, even our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world? Only he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. This is the one who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ. He did not come by water alone, but by water and blood. And it is the Spirit who testifies, because the Spirit is the truth. For there are three that testify, the Spirit, the water, and the blood and the three are in agreement. This is the word of the Lord.
please rise. The Gospel, according to St. John, the 15th chapter. Glory to you, o Lord. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you obey my commandments, you will remain in my love, just as I have obeyed my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. My command is this. Love each other as I have loved you. A greater love has no one than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I call you friends. For everything that I've learned from my Father, I've made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you. And I appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. Then the Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. This is my command. And together, love, love each other. other. And this is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you. Please be seated as we continue to sing. Together we pray. Father, may the words of my mouth and may the meditation of each of our hearts be acceptable unto you, our rock and our redeemer. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Based on the sheer number of shows that are all about detective work, there are a lot of us that love a good mystery. The love that who done it scenario that leaves us guessing until the end of the show or the end of the movie. As evidence begins to unravel and as we make some connections between what we're seeing and what we're hearing, we come to a conclusion about what indeed the facts are. But it can be extremely frustrating when you have an experience in life, and when you provide testimony about it, the evidence doesn't back up your perception. Have you ever taken your vehicle in to have it serviced because of a noise under the hood? And it always happens. The noise isn't there when they start looking. Or going to the doctor's office because you've had this persistent pain. And of course, the moment of the appointment, no pain. That is until you leave the doctor's office and then you find it again. Sometimes the evidence can be easily understood and sometimes it's elusive. Evidence, by definition, is a manifestation that furnishes a form of proof that leads to a conviction, a belief, a judgment. It may be an aching back. It could be under the hood of the car. It could be literally a crime scene and someone stole the crusty things in your gym bag and you're going, how'd that happen? And where'd it go? There are two types of evidences objective and subjective. The visual you'll see will identify the difference between one and the other. 
What you first look for are eyewitnesses. People that can provide you narrative that will begin to form an opinion about what the truth is in a given situation. Testimonial evidence, if you will, which is different than second-hand accounts. There's another term for second-hand accounts, and it's gossip or rumors, neither of which is admissible in the court of law, and both of which are condemned in Scripture. Christians are to look for evidence that is firsthand, eyewitness accounts, not second-hand information. Hearsay would be another way of calling gossip and rumor something else. It's a curious blend of fictions woven together by maybe a couple of facts, but hardly reliable. In fact, inherently not to our text. The early Christian church has now been scattered. Persecution focused on the city of Jerusalem, and Christians fled for their lives. As the scripture says, they're heading up the seacoast north, and some found themselves in the city of Antioch. And some of the Christians there chose to break with tradition and to share the news of Jesus Christ with non-Jewish listeners, Gentiles, The Hebrews call them goyim, you, me. And a large number of them not only heard the message of Christ, his cross and his resurrection, and God's love for us through him, but they believed that message with their heart. And news came back to Jerusalem about this thing that had not yet ever happened. The question is, is it gossip, rumor, or hearsay? What they heard was that in Antioch, non-Jewish people in large numbers believed and turned to the Lord. It was legal understanding that you have to test every spirit. And biblically, John suggests the same thing, because you know and I as well that you can't believe everything you hear. And so John, in his first little letter, says, test everything, because not everything is from God, but test everything to find what is from God. And the church in Jerusalem took that to heart, not taking this information as fact, And considering it quite possibly fiction, they needed eyewitnesses because hearsay is inherently unreliable. The church decided they needed eyewitness testimonies to what they are hearing is happening in Antioch. So the church in Jerusalem sent Barnabas up north. They chose well, because according to the Bible, Barnabas was a man whose integrity was intact. He was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and faith. They knew that they would be able to rely on his testimony. So they sent Barnabas north. But legal requirements of their day insisted that one testimony was not valid testimony, that everything had to be confirmed in the presence of two or three witnesses. Barnabas will need to take someone else with him to provide evidence and eyewitness accounts to what's happening in Antioch. An eyewitness needs to be an individual who is there in the event who can be called to account for their experiences and is reliable and competent in what they will share, the narrative 
that will be qualified as testimony, not in a court of law in this case, but before the congregation in Jerusalem. Barnabas will have to take someone else along with him, and he chose Saul, a convert to Christianity who had now become its leading advocate, who has begun to be recognized among Christians as a powerhouse of testimony and of conviction and of persuasion, Saul and Barnabas together will go to Antioch to see for themselves what rumor or hearsay or gossip might have led them to believe. So for a whole year, the scripture says, not for a weekend and not for a couple hours, for a whole year, Barnabas and Saul met with the church in Antioch. For a whole year, they witnessed what was happening. Jesus said, before he ascended into heaven, you will be my witnesses. Not just in Jerusalem or in Judea, but even to the ends of the earth. Saul and Barnabas will now realize what Jesus was speaking about as they are sent north. 350 miles from home to witness the working of the Holy Spirit among a non-Jewish community that has now been transformed by the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. They were eyewitnesses to what God was doing among people that had maybe no faith persuasion prior to this, or whose faith persuasion was radically different than a Jew or now a convert to Christianity would have experienced. They were eyewitnesses to the working of the Holy Spirit. And for a whole year, they saw it with their own eyes. They touched it. They experienced it, and they educated that community, that great number of people. They catechized them in the essential truths of the faith. They taught them what a Lutheran would insist are the six chief parts of the catechism. They talked to them about God. They talked to them about salvation, baptism, the Lord's Supper, confession and absolution, and the Ten Commandments. They shared with them the essence of the faith instructed them in Christianity. And Antioch will be the first place, not Jerusalem, Antioch will be the first place that people identified with the moniker Christian. The first time that a people would look at a world around them and say, that's what I am. I am a Christian. Beside eyewitness accounts, you want to also have documentary evidence when you're looking for proof and truth. And if you've watched Judge Wapner or whoever else you watch in the afternoon, it always amazed me how many people show up at that court session without any proof at all. And you know they're asking for documentation. Show me the receipts. Show me the evidence. Put it in print. Let me look at it as a judge. A written document or documents that give proof and lend to the credibility of what you're saying occurred. You want dates, you want times, you want names, you want examples, you want details. Don't tell me what you think. Show me the evidence of the truth that you insist. It's not unusual that happens in Scripture as well. Samuel did it. The apostles documented the working of the Holy Spirit among them and in the communities that they found themselves witnessing to. In fact, all of Scripture is a written account so that we might believe and be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Write it down. If you're in any kind of managerial situation, you know how important that is. Write it down. Because there may be a time you need to go back to it, and our memories are not as 
clear or precise as a document. Write it down. And all Scripture is an opportunity to write it down and to document the central truth that Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior. To the Christians in Jerusalem and to the Christians in now Antioch and to the Christians in Overland Park and in Stillwell. In Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit transforms each of our lives into a written doc document. A document intended for one reason, and that is to testify to the truth that anyone who sees us is given evidence of the love of God within our life. And everyone who comes in contact with us can read the truth of God's love, his grace, and his mercy in the world. We are the who, what, when, why, where of this moment that the world desperately needs to see documented, and all of which points to the glory of God and the building of the Lord's kingdom. The mass of information assembled in a case becomes irrefutable evidence. It's real and it's tangible. The church in Jerusalem needed real and tangible evidence that despite this intense persecution, the Christian church was exploding in ways that they never imagined or ever dreamed might happen. Irrefutable evidence amounts to the volume of the evidence assembled and compiled. And the credibility of that evidence that you have before you and ultimately the consistency of the evidence that ultimately leads us to the conviction that this is the truth. The church in Jerusalem needed to have the volume. They needed the credibility and they needed the consistency and they sent Saul and Barnabas to witness to it. The world around us today is no different. It needs to know the volume of the evidence of the love of God in the world in which we live. They need to see that there is credibility to that evidence. And most of all, it needs to be consistent. The volume of the evidence begins by the documentation of all the things surrounding Jesus Christ. And I just grabbed the Gospel of John and began to write some of the documented moments, irrefutable events witnessed by so many, beginning with the changing of water into wine, the walking on water. None of these things were done in isolation or with only one eyewitness available. The feeding of how many? 5,000, 4,000, the exercising of demons. There was always a crowd of witnesses that said, yes, it happened. The raising of the dead and the crowd that chuckled that this person had been dead for how many days and you're not going to do a thing about it and they watched it happen. The volume of the evidence is irrefutable. The sheer number of first-hand eyewitnesses to the resurrection. Scripture says over 500 witnessed our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ risen from the dead. Over 500. Most of which they said is still alive today. Oh, some had fallen asleep. The sheer volume, the myriad of people from every tribe, every nation, every tongue, despite their political and otherwise differences, who confess one and the same conviction. Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior. We may not be able to converse more than a single word with someone who lives several thousand miles away from our continent. And yet, if there is saving faith, there is a certain, a certain and clear communication of one central truth. Jesus Christ is my Lord 
and he is my Savior. And that hasn't changed in the last 10 or 1,000 or 2,000 years. The credibility of the evidence. And there are a, a variety of things that you could compile. There's the Latin if you need it, but I'd prefer the English. The physical evidence, the direct evidence, the circumstantial, the trace, and the associative evidence, all of that compiled. You want to look at it and goes, is it credible? Is there integrity? And, and the first litmus test is a people that are willing in despite of threats of persecution and death to stand there and make their confession, to provide a clear testimony over and over again of the race that they run together in the same direction toward life everlasting. And I, the first example I give you is Acts chapter 7. As Stephen is prepared to be stoned to death, he says, let me share with you my convictions. Surely he at that point could have well said, ah, I've been kidding all the way along. and I'm not really sure I believe in this. Well, someone told me that. I don't know. I've never saw it. But no, he stood there and he said, Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. The credibility of the myriad of witnesses that despite penalty and pain, took that stand and made that con good confession is irrefutable evidence. And when given the opportunity, they spoke. They communicated as if it were, as Scripture says, the very Word of God with great patience and with careful instruction. A victim of our most recent political environments is truth. We have become a very skeptical people. We trust very few and very little. We question everything we hear. In fact, many today in positions of influence will say, the only truth that you can absolutely believe in is your truth. I don't know what that is, but your truth. And you should live your truth. As if there are many truths, you just have to live by your truth. We've abandoned the idea that there is an objective or a universal truth or an absolute truth at all. It's just your truth. And in the process, any absolute and universally applied truth has been lost. And yet in the court of law, what do we ask for? A guarantee that you will speak the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So help me, God. So even as a society begins to destroy the concept of absolute truth, we still insist that it is the only basis of justice. It is the only evidence that we can go to the bank with. And over the centuries... When given the opportunity, God's people have taken their stand and they have spoke that truth as if it were the very word of God. And they've done it patiently. They've done it carefully. And it has been profoundly an impact upon society. The other irrefutable part of evidence is its consistency. It's the key. That what you hear, depending on who says it, is always the same thing. It's the same story. And that's only possible by the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit that inspires us to open our mouths and declare his praises. Despite the generation, despite the context, despite our language and our political barriers, to be able to stand up and say, Jesus Christ died and rose from the grave. Jesus Christ is my Lord and my Savior. A people that over the centuries have consistently committed themselves to one and the same things. According to Acts, the apostles' teachings. 
According to Acts, the breaking of bread and the Lord's Supper. According to Acts, prayer. A people that consistently have shown evidence of God's grace in their life through inspired and enabled ability to love as they have been first loved. To persevere in the face of every challenge and every difficulty. A willingness to speak the truth, but always to speak it in love and charity and compassion. And when we open our mouths to make sure that what we say is wholesome and beautiful and right and lovely and praiseworthy, and always approach life and the people around us with gentleness, with compassion and carefulness. And over the centuries, those are evidences of the grace of God in the community that God gathers that we call the church. The increasing ability to love and persevere, to speak with love and truth wholesomely and with gentleness, and a willingness to respond in the face of crisis or calamity, to reach out and make an impact on other people's lives. According to the scriptures in Antioch, the disciples heard about a famine. And what did they do? What any good Lutheran would think to do. You take an offering. And they did that. And they sent the results back to Jerusalem with Barnabas and Saul. It is evidence of the grace of God in our life. Our offerings are no small thing, good Christians. They are our worship as well. They are evidence of the charity of God bubbling over in our hearts. And to this day, it remains probably the most significant, irrefutable evidence of God's love for us in Jesus Christ. Right there in that collection plate. Right at that moment in the service. When in charity, we reach out not only to our own community, but to the community at large in the name that is above every other name, in the name of Jesus. It is faith. It is always faith. Demonstrating itself in love. That's the evidence that the world must see today. The evidence of things they cannot analyze on their own, that they cannot dissect. It is our love that demonstrates the evidence of God's grace, his presence in our life, and his love for the world that he sent his son to die for. And the greatest evidence that we can provide the world today is love, charity, compassion, gentleness. And all God's people said, amen. amen. Yes, and amen. And may the peace that passes all human understanding keep your hearts and minds in faith until life everlasting. Amen. Would you rise and join me in the words of the Apostles' Creed? We confess. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, he was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended to heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life of the Please be seated. This is that moment in the service where we have an opportunity to worship in a very unique way. Uh, we have not passed collection plates for almost a year, and I thought Lutherans would never adjust to that, but we have, and I thank God for that. So you'll see a number of ways that you can provide your act of worship through giving, and I encourage you to do that this moment. While we're doing that, would you, if you have not yet filled out the communication card in your prayer request, please do that as well. Again, there won't be a plate coming by, but on your way out, drop it in the collection plate. With that, we continue with our service.
Please rise and let's sing together the offertory. Father, we praise you for your charity, that you would love us so much that you would send your only Son to bear our sin and to be our Savior. And we thank you for the opportunity to be a people of charity and to grow in generosity, not only to your greater glory, but to the building of your kingdom here on earth. Receive our gifts. May they be true expressions of our commitment that we are seeking first your kingdom and all of its righteousness. And may those gifts, tithes, and offerings be to your glory and to the building of that kingdom. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Merciful and gracious Father, we thank you for the gift of rebirth. We thank you for the sacrament of baptism. And we join with those this month who celebrate their baptismal birthdays, that moment when you mark them with the cross of Christ and you adopted them into your family and you bathe them in the blood of the Lamb. With Molly and Lynn and Carmen, Evan and Tracy, Bo and Kim and Scott and William and Troy, Karen and Josh, we thank you that you've included them in your family and declared them heirs according to promise. Lord, in your mercy. Father, we thank you for the gift of our moms. We thank you for the love they've expressed to us, and we ask that you would bless them, keep them, and encourage them to fix their gaze upon the author and perfecter of our faith, Jesus Christ, and run with perseverance the race set before them. Lord, in your mercy. Father, we pray for those who are now beginning that travel toward membership in our congregation and are searching the scripture. And we ask, Lord, you would bless their efforts as they study the scripture and discover their faith journey with you and their need to connect to not only you, but the body of Christ that you've assembled. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. We pray for the eighth grade graduates as they begin to end their experience here at Bethany and continue their academic journeys elsewhere. We pray, Lord, that you would strengthen them in the task ahead. Encourage them, Lord, with them, our moms to run again that race that's set before them. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. We pray for Cora, who this next week will be baptized and brought into your kingdom. Keep her safe as she travels with family and bring her into the services of God's house where you will include her in your kingdom. Lord, in your mercy, Hear our prayer. we pray for Sean and Molly as they begin their preparations to join us in ministry here. We pray for the end of their academic experience in St. Louis. And we pray, Lord, that your will be done in their life. And you open windows and opportunities for them to come join us in this corner of the harvest and to lift high the cross of Christ. Lord, in your mercy, Hear our prayer. We pray for those who are hurting and struggling in need of healing, for Marianne and Bill and Dayland and Morris, for Brad and Doug and Hick Young. And we ask, Lord, that you would wrap your loving arms around them, that you would comfort them with your word and spirit. And if it's your will to restore and to repair, we give you all glory and honor and praise. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. And for couples that are anticipating the birth of children, particularly Hoyt and Kylie, as they anticipate the arrival of that child, 
protect them from harm and danger. And when that anticipated moment arrives, bring this child into your presence and include this child in your kingdom. Wrap your loving arms around them. In the raiments of righteousness, clothe this child and declare them one of your own through the waters of baptism. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray. Trusting in your mercy through your Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who's taught us that prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. As we prepare to leave, remember, kind of hang out in the gathering space a little bit. Look at the giving tree and take those bags that remain, if you would, and receive now the blessing of our Father. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord look upon you and his face shine upon you. And as he looks upon you and his favor upon you, may he give you his peace. Amen.